our second remote lecture that we were able to offer this spring. Uh, my name is Scott Pike, and I'm the president of the Salem Society. Uh, and uh, it, again, it's, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you all here. My, my typical duties as, uh, as president is to delegate responsibilities and not do much at all, which is pretty much what I do all year. Uh, so before we even get started, I just wanna thank Raina Myers for her uh, support in organizing all this and Rob Chenault, who is our program coordinator for the AIA, who uh, will be introducing tonight's speaker. But before we get to that, I just I do wanna talk a little bit about the AIA. Uh, those of you who are members are very familiar with our association, but for those of you who are not, I feel like it's, uh, it's our responsibility to, to discuss the, the, what, this great organization uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and to recognize that it is the Archaeological Institute of America that is providing us with tonight's speaker, uh, Catherine Gleason, uh, and, and, our and our series. Uh, the AIA is the oldest archaeological association in the United States. It has about 200,000 members. Uh, some members are professional, other members are just people who are interested in our past, whether our past be a historical past or maybe further back into antiquity. Um, the society does various different functions. It not only supports research and the professional archeologists, it also supports the education. It advocates for preservation and conservation of our archeological past. It provides outlets and public lectures such as this one uh, for everyone in the community, whether they be members or not. Uh, it also has a publication branch uh, where it produces archeology span magazine, uh, a general readership magazine, as well as uh, the AJA, American Journal of Archeology, span which is a uh, professional publication. So the AIA as a whole is this very large umbrella of, of activities to support archeology. span So if you're not a member, I strongly, strongly encourage you to join. Uh, for non-professionals, that is non-academic or professional archeologists, membership is $70. It's not, hopefully that's not a huge ask. I certainly understand this last year uh, has been stressful and uh, maybe, maybe that is beyond your, your abilities. But if, if you do have the abilities, we strongly, strongly encourage you to join the AIA. If you live in Salem, uh, you would join the Salem Society. I understand we have people in the audience from other states and all the way from the East Coast. Uh, so uh, when you, if and when you join, please join your local society. We are made up of over 100 affiliated societies. So find your local society and please join. Uh, the best way to do that is to go to the archeology, span uh, the AIA uh, uh, webpage. Uh, it's archeological.org uh, and you will find all the information about the society there. Uh, I really think the AIA tried to get AIA.org, but the architects beat us to it and they have the website. So uh, I think it's the Arch Architectural Institute of America. So anyway, don't go there. I mean, you can join that too, but make sure if you're gonna join, join the AIA. Uh, so without much uh, further ado, oh, I did wanna mention one more thing. Uh, I was sort of glancing through the website uh, prior to tonight's lecture. And I did notice that there is a, uh, uh, a function on April 24th called Archeocon. And this is a fun-filled day of various archeological activities, including public lectures, live presentations, hands-on workshops. And I find that's gonna be very interesting uh, and interviews. And all this will be done online uh, through uh, I'm assuming Zoom, but maybe some other, other uh, way. Uh, this is a ticketed event, but the tickets cost five dollars. Uh, and if you that well, it's five dollars if you buy your ticket before April 18th. So if you really are itching to do more archaeology, have more presentations, 
you can go to the archaeological.org website and learn more about Archaeocon. Uh, I also want to say to our local society members, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and uh, we really are, uh, are glad you're with us now. And we are all itching very much to return to some normalcy. We very much hope that's going to be in the fall. Things are looking good, but I'm not going to make any promises because that will only get me into trouble. But uh, I do. we are planning for a full lecture series for next academic year. And we uh, hope you continue joining us and supporting uh, local and international archaeology. OK. So uh, I'm now going to introduce uh, Rob Chenault. He's a professor here at Willamette University in classical studies and history. He's also the AIA program manager, as I said, and he's the one who facilitates and works with the AIA to organize our lecture series. Rob? OK, thanks very much, uh, Scott. Um, and thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. We have um, quite a large turnout uh, for our second and final archaeology lecture of uh, this semester and, and this school year, uh, unlike any other. At least, um, as Scott said, that is our hope, as we are, we are optimistic that um, we may be able to return to some in-person events um, next semester. Um, uh, we know that, that Zoom events obviously are not anyone's favorite form of fellowship, and, and we're certainly looking forward to, to welcoming all of our members back uh, to campus as, as soon as possible. Um, so uh, without further ado, tonight it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Catherine Gleason, Professor of Landscape Architecture at Cornell University. Professor Gleason brings to her work a unique uh, combination of academic training, holding a master's in landscape architecture from Harvard University and a PhD in European archaeology from the University of Oxford. She is currently a senior fellow in garden and landscape studies at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, DC. She is an internationally renowned specialist on the archaeology of past landscapes, especially the design and interpretation of ancient Roman and Mediterranean parks, gardens, and landscapes. Her primary area of research is the Mediterranean region of the ancient Roman world. She has served since 2008, for example, as the senior landscape archaeologist at the Gardens of Stabiae project on the Bay of Naples. Through excavation projects at Petra in Jordan, Caesarea Maritima in Israel, and Horace's Villa in Rome in Italy, her research uncovers the built nature of these landscapes and their role in the various cultures of the empire. In addition to her research on Roman gardens, Professor Gleason also brings her research to bear on the 21st century landscape by teaching approaches to design with the physical remains of the past. She applies ancient methods of arid climate cultivation to modern problems of development, seeking to sustain contemporary culture through a recognition of the temporal depth and materiality of every landscape. Her field research uh, recently has taken her to India, Jordan, Israel, and Italy. Her talk tonight surveys exciting new discoveries of Roman gardens around Europe, Asia, and North Africa. In the 25 years since Wilhelmina Yashemsky completed her last field season and provides an exciting update to Yashemsky's work. Please join me in giving a warm digital welcome to Catherine Gleason for her talk on finding the gardens of the Roman Empire. Catherine, you're on mute. There you go. Well, thank you for your kind in introduction. Um, I'm very um, happy to be the Willemina and Stanley Yashemsky lecturer for the this spring, um, which is appropriate to the talk that I'm giving tonight. Um, and this lecture was um, named in honor of Willemina and Stanley um, 
in recognition of the unique partnership that they had uh, in their work in archaeology, particularly garden archaeology, as I'll be talking about tonight. My talk tonight is Finding the Gardens of the Roman Empire, and I'll, I'll try and give some updates, um, but I am also going to reflect on maybe some of the lesser known gardens um, that uh, came into play in uh, coming, bringing the Gardens of the Roman Empire project together. And so I'll be starting pretty early uh, and working up through uh, the present time. The Gardens of the Roman Empire project is in some ways a legacy project of um, Willemine Yashemsky, who is the great pioneer of garden archeology. span uh, She was born in 1910 in York, Nebraska, and she um, was educated in the classics, having uh, read the last days of Pompeii as a child, which motivated her to uh, go on and study in the classical fields. And she completed her PhD at the University of Chicago, um, working on aspects of uh, Roman law. Um, and so it wasn't until after she was tenured at the University of Maryland that she actually went, began um, a new project in her career. And I'll speak a little bit about that, uh, which was this, the idea of uh, studying the gardens of the Roman Empire. She met uh, Stanley uh, Yashemsky at the University of um, uh, Mer uh, the University of Chicago, and they really uh, formed a unique partnership. It wasn't common in those days for uh, a woman to continue working after marriage, but there was no question that she would continue her career as a scholar. And he was um, a, a highly regarded physicist in his own right, but he took uh, all his vacations to uh, assist her in her work. What I'd like to do is um, look over the, the formation of the project because in many ways it's the formation of a discipline. And the um, timeline I'd like to take you through begins with the idea of the gardens of the Roman Empire project and what kinds of things were known about ancient gardens at that time and how that led to her own studies, her work at Pompeii and other sites being excavated at the time. This, her experiences in this time, not just at Pompeii, but in her travels, uh, led to the um, Roman Garden Conferences that took place at Dumbarton Oaks in 1979 and 1984. And in many ways, these were the first international gatherings of scholars working on Roman gardens. And we'll look at, uh, at what that catalyzed uh, leading up to 1995. Um, and in this period, this is when Willemine Yashemsky resumes work on gardens of the Roman Empire, having worked in, in Pompeii for so long. Um, and another gathering at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Museum. And then we'll see a kind of explosion of interest in garden archaeology. And I'll do no justice to all the new sites that were developed in that time period. Um, but it will lead to the evolution of the, the print book. Um, and then I'd like to spend a little time on the website and show you how that works. Because one of the wonderful things about to happen on April 15th is the launch of the Gardens of the Roman Empire. Uh, projects website, which is inviting all of you to join in and interact with this site and use it as a tool in your work. But let's go back to the 1950s uh, when Willemina Yashemsky was a newly tenured professor, I believe, at the University of Maryland. And she wanted to move away from law and consider daily life in the Roman world. And she her husband suggested that given her love of gardens personally, that this might be a way into um, reaching that goal. At the, at the time, the, there weren't many um, re, uh, synth syntheses on the topic. 
So there was Marie Louise Gottheim's uh, survey of sites in her um, uh, work on garden history. Um, the main source at the time was Pierre Grimal's Les Jardins Romains. And this was a very important resource and to many thought to be fairly complete. However, it did focus primarily on Rome. And so um, uh, it was an ancient history work rather than an archeological work, but Willemine Yashemsky was also an ancient historian and wanted to expand that understanding to the empire as a whole. Now there were other gar there were major other garden projects um, that were known to her and also not known to her. Uh, Dorothy Burr Thompson's work um, for the American School of Classical Studies with the um, Temple of Hephaestus in Athens in the 1930s was really a model of excellent um, archaeology, garden archaeology in the in the bedrock surrounding the temple. She found a series of cuttings and after ruling out votive pits, um, she did careful stratigraphic excavation that you can see on the right, recording the different types of earth, filling the pits and towards the bottom encountered these flower pots that you can see in the bottom of this photo and here, and also um, noted their position within the planting pit. The area was subsequently replanted with their idea of what the kinds of shrubs that might have grown there. Archaeobotany wasn't so well developed at that time, and the topsoil had been eroded from the site. Also, um, an important excavation from the 1930s uh, was in Conambriga, Portugal. Um, the excavations of these really quite remarkable gardens, um, urban gardens that were quite architectonic. They were um, masonry edged planting beds um, filled with earth and then with plants and fully plumbed with small jets uh, to create this fantastic effect. And these ge geometric gardens of the um, second century AD were, uh, you know, their strong geometries really balanced out the, the um, geometries of the surrounding mosaics on the walkways around the peristyles of these gardens. So you, it's shown in white here, but if you look at the lower uh, image, you can see the fantastic mosaics surrounding these gardens. A lesser known project, um, was the winter palace complex of Wadi Kelp, thought at the time to be New Testament Jericho. Uh, this was conducted by uh, Dimitri Baranki, who's generally regarded as the father of Palestinian archaeology, and James Kelso, um, site located on the um, at, uh, on Wadi Kelp, uh, outside of uh, the ancient city of Jericho. And uh, here you can see um, Baramsky and Kelso in the garden of the Albright Institute. I love that picture. <laughs> uh, and they excavated this monumental garden complex. Um, and you can't uh, blame them for thinking that they were in an urban center rather than a palace. But uh, here you can see the great hemicycle under excavation. And that's this area right here. Um, the fuller plan would be known, would be reconstructed by Ehud uh, Netzer um, some years later, um, but you can see that it was part of it, what they called the sunken garden complex. And this whole hemicycle was um, stepped like a theater and everywhere they dug up into the seats, they encountered not places for people to sit, but hundreds of planting pots, um, which you can see here. So this was a huge garden um, complex and recognized as such at the time. There wasn't a lot of study of the soils, but the planting pots uh, left little doubt as to how this worked uh, in conjunction with some reflecting pools and other water features. Another project 
of the 1930s. Um, well, there are two here. Um, and one was the Villa of Horace at Licenza. This was quite well known at the time. It was beautifully re recorded by uh, the landscape architect Thomas Dries Price, who was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome in 1931 to 33. And he went to see the old excavations, was having trouble drawing them, but an arrangement was set up with the um, Italian arche uh, archeologist Giuseppe Lulli, who um, worked on further excavations with him um, to record these drawings that you see here on the left. Uh, really, this one, the re reconstruction is quite fanciful. It's more like a Renaissance garden than an ancient one. Um, but his state plan of what was actually found has been really helpful. And even the section down below is a very accurate uh, recording of the slope and character of the site. He went on to Pompeii um, to make a record of uh, what was known at the time as the house of Lareus Tiburtinus, uh, now called Octavius Cortio. And again, I don't have the original drawings of these. I, I was able to get the ones on the left from one of his heirs, but uh, here you can see the publication showing all of the root cavities that were discovered in Spinazzola's excavation, really helpful map and not very well known. It's in the memoirs of the American Academy in Rome, but not a well-known article. And reconstructed here, more like ancient gardens that as we know them now as a series of strolling paths along a, a beautiful central water feature. So, so these were very, um, these images were published in garden history books of the time. And just, I don't know, this, the, they didn't, pub, we weren't able to publish later, we weren't able to publish Horace's Villa in color. And yet we've got these beautiful color scans. So I like to take a moment to, to show them. Um, and here you can see in detail um, this large uh, villa garden with its central pool and in section, the um, it's pr probably a fairly accurate plan. And I'll talk about returning to this site later. Now, of course, Pompeii had been a very well-known site of gardens um, when Yashemsky started out um, with remains found back to the earliest years of the excavations. And she was aware of a range of evidence at Pompeii. Oops, sorry. Um, as I mentioned, the last days of Pompeii had inspired her to go into the field. It was very well-known blockbuster <laughs> film in those days. But when you, uh, there was a range of evidence that would come up in all kinds of contexts. I gotta stop clicking. <laughs> uh, here you can see on the right, um, uh, the house of, uh, Diomedes, this plan by a, sorry, typo there, Louis uh, uh, Deutsch and the Naples Museum from 1817, um, very early plan. And here you can see the, the garden beds have been delineated on the plan. And that garden was uh, reconstructed for tourists. And um, here is a, a photograph from the 1870s of how it looked at the time. These reconstructions were widely available as uh, stereoscopic views and reproduced um, widely in publications. This is the house of, this is the Pride of Julia Felix, um, records from the superintendency that she would have uh, known to consult um, and engravings such as that of um, the house of Queen Caroline. And so, when she and um, Stanley began their first trips overseas to begin touring uh, the gardens of the Roman Empire after about five years, several years of research, um, she assumed that Pompeii was already pretty well covered and she would just dedicate one chapter of gardens of the Roman Empire uh, to this study. And so, um, uh, 
she and Stanley took three trips uh, overseas to pursue gardens of the, the Roman Empire. And these are um, recorded in her memoirs, um, discovering the gardens of Pompeii. Uh, um, and she uh, put her memoirs together towards the end of her life and her friend Klapper Alman assembled them into um, a publication that you can purchase at uh, amazon.com. And, you know, she, the, her trips are really very interesting to read about in the years uh, after World War II. One of the things that's particularly striking about um, her travels, she was, the, part of her travels were to record sites for her, the courses that she was teaching in Greek and Roman culture but she was also trying to record um, the sites of ancient gardens that she read about. And when you read the memoirs, you can see that she, she kind of has trouble finding ones where you can actually see anything, <laughs> where there had been any excavations or, um, so she visits the Athens and the temple of Hephaestus, but there aren't actually very many um, sites that she's able to record. Rather, she immerses herself in the Mediterranean landscape. She, having come from Kansas, it was a very different world, but she was raised in farm country on the plains and beautiful attention to what is happening in the Mediterranean landscape there. Um, at the end of her first trip, they spent a day in Pompeii thinking that you know this was gonna be a, an easy uh, site to write up. Um, and regretted that and returned again in 1957. And by then she had begun, she'd learned of the um, records of um, Tatiana Warsher, who was a Russian scholar who'd been working on Pompeii um, since the 1920s and um, had put together a voluminous typescript on the Codex Topographicus Pompeianus, along with some other um, works that she had done specifically on gardens. And uh, it's very interesting to read about uh, uh, Tatiana Warsher's intentions in putting the material together. She never published it, but she saw it as an effort to gather together all of the uh, information about the different um, houses at Pompeii systematically, insula by insula, um, so that it would make it easier for students and other archaeologists to start to pursue different themes of study. And this uh, particular paragraph really speaks to, I think, some of the influence that she had on Willemine Yashemsky's thinking about her own project. Um, ultimately, um, Madame Warsher told Wilhelmina that her first book would not be Gardens of the Rom Roman Empire, it would be the Gardens of Pompeii. And uh, uh, Wilhelmina Yashemsky is a little bit uh, uh, pushed back on this a little bit, but ultimately uh, after spending two seasons in 1957 and nine, um, exploring the site um, together and going to, a, many of the gardens, uh, she was convinced that this in fact would be her, her project. She was very fortunate in the time that she was able to spend with Madame Warsher who died in 1960. Um, but this set her on her way to cataloging over the next uh, two decades and more, uh, 642 gardens. Um, that she cataloged at Pompeii. And you can see the incredible range of conditions of these gardens. <laughs> Everything from waist deep weeds to fairly well-maintained, but still weedy reconstructed sites to um, fully replanted gardens to overgrown replanted gardens. And so it was uh, always a challenge for her to um, uh, analyze the sites on the ground. And she, at back home, kept these set of big blue index cards where she would have the historical information, uh, earlier views, what the material she could get from the superintendency of the type I showed you earlier. 
and start to put to piece together the evidence for all of these gardens that she surveyed. Starting in 1961, she was able to undertake actual excavations. Um, she, over the years, she excavated 11 vineyards, commercial gardens, and house gardens at Pompeii, um, work at the Bascoriali uh, Villa Rustica, and uh, Plantis uh, Villa A, seven gardens there. So she, and while she did these, she continued during each day to go and visit more of the gardens towards that 643. In addition, um, she re uh, recorded uh, 202 paintings that are in uh, her catalog. And here, Stanley Yashemsky played a key role. Uh, he was the photographer of these paintings and recorded them in Kodachrome, which, is, had, which ultimately proved to be archivally very stable. And so his uh, collection of slides um, provides records of many paintings that have disappeared and others that are not nearly in the same condition as when they were photographed. Many of these are available in Pompeian pictures and um, our project also has some addi additional slides that are not in Pompeian pictures, but will be made available through uh, our website and then shared with Pompeian pictures. Now, the methodology that she used in her research is one that gave me a little pause at first, but in studying her work, I've really come to see the, the, the value of it. Her working methodology involved a very close working relationship with Stanley in the field. And she deployed the memo pad, which you can see here. And these are just small, you know, hand-sized memo pads that she would fit pack with information. So here you can see um, dimensions, um, of plans that Stanley would later draft up. You can see her longhand notes and descriptions. At the end, of, Stanley would be taking the photographs. At the end of the day, he'd give her the roll numbers and she'd insert uh, the frame numbers into these memo pads. Everything was in, um, in these uh, memo pads. Uh, here you can see the names of her worker, work, workmen. Um, and basically, within the working relationship with Stanley, she had the memo pads, the measuring tape. I think they relied on survey information from the superintendency and ongoing projects. And then Kodachrome, which to us is a now an obsolete uh, film, but at the time was a pretty uh, cutting edge uh, form of photographic film to be using. It had only recently been slide projectors had been made available at a discount to educators so that slides could be uh, shown and it was the technology of the, the future. The other, the other key to the moving through as many um, excavation sites and survey sites as they did is that early on, uh, Nicola Cicignano was uh, appointed to her as someone who had done a lot of the root casting. Um, so at Pompeii, you would clear out the volcanic material from holes in the ground that were filled with volcanic ash. And after cleaning them out, pour concrete or plaster into them, gesso. And here you can see Willemine Yashemsky measuring one of those casts. And so her foreman um, stayed, you know, worked with her the whole time that she was at Pompeii. And the team of uh, workers uh, were within the larger families, but they were very stable. And she got to know them personally, visited their homes, really learned a lot uh, about cultivation and agricultural life in the area around Pompeii. She very much valued um, their observations. And may, often these um, uh, visits and um, comparative notes are recorded also in the memo books. So today, you know, I'm 
got a dig at Pompeii. We've got the iPads. We've got the big teams of students and volunteers and computers crashing and connections not working to the satellites and the surveying equipment. And here she is. I can see how she got through as many sites as she did uh, with the lower tech way of working. Ultimately, in 1979 um, and 19, well, it took a longer for the second volume, 1993, but the results of these efforts um, were published in 1979, um, the, the year leading up to her retirement from the University of Maryland. Um, you know, I should note that she was in her later 40s when she started this project. She was in her 50s doing the excavations. If you're thinking that you've gotten a little behind in life, uh, <laughs> she's a great role model. Um, and so uh, she published Gardens of Pompeii. And uh, this was the volume of essays that came first on all aspects of life at Pompeii based on her studies, uh, followed by the second volume of all the sites that she had looked at. Now, a lot of the line drawings of Pompeii don't really give you, and she didn't uh, provide a different version herself, the line drawings don't really give you a strong impression of just how many gardens, uh, urban gardens are in the city of Pompeii. And so as part of our project, Michelle Palmer, a landscape architect, um, really sized the line work and, took all of the um, Yashemsky's catalog entries and uh, filled them in in green. And you can see the remarkable uh, contribution that this catalog of sites has made to Pompeii in revealing it to be an extraordinarily a uh, green city by our standards today. And this uh, plan will be made openly available on the website. Now, she wasn't the only person excavating at the time, and I'll just give you a couple of examples of sites that were being excavated in the 60s. And one of the important ones was uh, Barry Cunliffe's work at Fishbourne, Roman Villa um, in Sussex in England. And um, here you can see he was a, a, actually an Iron Age archaeologist, well-trained in the prehistoric methods of archaeology. And in excavating um, this first century uh, AD villa, and you can see this large peristyle um, with the internal garden area here. And if you note this pattern uh, down the central walkway of the garden, it came to light as a series of strange trench cuttings. And the clay, the, the the leveling fill of this courtyard was a bright yellow clay. And these features were in dark organic brown soil. And they tried to think of everything they could, palisades, all kinds of weird, and nothing made any sense until finally they thought it had to be for hedges for a garden. A lot of local botanists and gardeners thought that plants wouldn't survive, they'd get waterlogged. Um, but when they reconstructed box hedging, it's thrived for several decades now. So uh, there began um, Cunliffe's investigation into this garden, which included both excellent stratigraphy, but also a number of uh, techniques of environmental archeology, span um, plant macro remains, paleontology that methodologically were a could have been a model for other archeologists <laughs> and, and Yashevsky and uh, he knew of each other's work. But surprisingly, more archeologists in England didn't adopt uh, an interest in the gardens at this time. Um, at Herodium on the west uh, outside of Bethlehem, um, Herod's fortress palace and burial place were investigated by the um, uh, French in Jerusalem under Bajilio uh, Corbo. Uh, and they, uh, in, in the very top of this extraordinary uh, fortress palace built by Herod the Great, um, at the base is a little 
uh, palace uh, palatial complex of luxurious baths and reception rooms. And they detected the remains of a garden based, I think, entirely on the presence of cultivated soil um, and reconstructed it here. Um, this work in this was carried on in the 70s by Ehud Netzer, um, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who'd been working um, at Masada and felt that there must be gardens in the southern area of that complex. Um, he worked on the other side of Wadi Kelt and uh, uh, firmly identified the area as the Hasmonead and Herodian uh, winter palaces rather than New Testament Jericho. And again, was guided both by good soil stratig <laughs> stratigraphy and the, the discovery of many, many of these planting pots that had been found during the 1950s excavations. Now, um, so in this time period, uh, as Willamine uh, Yashemsky gave talks on her work at Pompeii, she learned of these other gardens uh, as her work became increasingly published and other archeologists got in touch with her. She um, developed the idea of an international gathering of archeologists to come and share their discoveries. And so the first of these was held at Dumbarton Oaks as part of their symposium on the history of landscape architecture. Um, and she worked with Elizabeth Blair McDougall, who was the director of studies at Dumbart, uh, of landscape studies at Dumbarton Oaks at that time. And this was really an extraordinary gathering. It was the first time scholars had gotten together to talk about archeological evidence of gardens and garden culture. And um, I have to say it changed my life. I went there as an undergraduate student and met Barry Cunliffe and my life was <laughs> changed forever after that. Um, but in terms of the formation of the discipline, it's really come to be seen as the kind of moment of the birth of garden archeology span as a coordinated, inter, uh, uh, coordinated gathering of, of, of scholars and archeologists to start to put their heads together and, and look at this whole project in a, a comprehensive way. And, Gardens of Campania, of Gaul, of Portugal, these early ones at Conambriga that I mentioned to you, Cunliffe's work at uh, Fishbourne and other gardens of Britain uh, he presented uh, there. Um, and this was followed not long after by a second conference at Dumbarton Oaks, which continued to advance the discussion of, of Roman garden culture and towards the project of Gardens of the Roman Empire presented the new work at a Boscoriale and Aplantis, as well as important discoveries in Rome and uh, new findings in Gaul. And uh, in 1982, Stanley Yashemsky died suddenly of a heart attack. And this was a great shock. She was able to complete the work at Aplantis and Boscoriale that they had been doing together uh, with the help of their friends. Uh, Stan, um, uh, her, her niece came to photograph, everyone rallied around to try and provide that same kind of close teamwork that she had enjoyed um, with Stanley in the earlier years. Uh, but um, she, finished that work and did not begin new work at Pompeii. Rather, she um, brought together all the scientists that she'd been working with uh, at Pompeii on her gardens to write a natural history of Pompeii. And I think this is another groundbreaking work in which um, scientists and humanists were brought together uh, to create um, an approach to the study of the Pompeian landscape, but serves as a model to, for other um, environmental archaeology of designed landscapes and urban landscapes 
um, to this day. And then around that time, um, the second volume of Gardens of Pompeii came out. Now, by this time, one of the impacts of the Dumbarton Oaks lectures had been to convince her that she was not going to write the Gardens of the Roman Empire as a single authored book. That so many, she could see the, the range of issues and it, it, as many of the sites that she had seen um, at the conferences that I've shared, some of which I've shared with you here, each really required the specialist of that area to uh, properly describe uh, the gardens, but also these um, scholars knew of other gardens that were only published in local journals. Um, and so uh, she began to conceive of the gardens of the Roman empire as um, a multi-authored work. And I think uh, on the natural history of Pompeii uh, gave her some insights into that project. After she left, um, gardens were continued to be studied um, under the, the leadership of Anna Maria Charalo, who um, brought a, more of a botanist point of view um, and published widely on the gardens of Pompeii and um, helped to promote the discoveries of new gardens uh, that, were, that were found there. Um, Wilhelmina Yashemsky went on. She was, was interested in applying the methods that she had developed at Pompeii um, <coughs> uh, to gardens outside of the very special preservation conditions there. And so in 1987, she began work with uh, Eugenia Salza Prina Riccati, an um, uh, architect who you could see here on the right. Um, she had been, uh, they were had worked closely together and um, uh, Nina was asked to be the area editor for, for Italy. And here you can see the results of their excavations. Um, from Wilhelmina's perspective, it was a little disappointing. Most of her archeological work had been on very well-preserved surfaces. And here at uh, Hadrian's Villa in the Piazza d'Oro, not, the bedrock was way up close to the surface and the upper garden levels were not preserved well. However, um, uh, Riccati pointed out that it was a, probably a sub irrigation system to the garden, allowing the plants to be watered from the water supply system uh, underneath um, as well as above. Uh, and so they were able to reconstruct um, roughly what this garden might have, have looked like. They also did work at Adrian's Villa at the Canopus um, and in this area. And you can see the planting pots that they found embedded in the soil here. So they had a very different stratigraphic uh, situation at Hadrian's Villa. And of course, uh, other garden excavations continued on uh, after this, um, that um, Salsaprina Riccati kept track of for the um, Gardens of the Roman Empire project, and you'll be able to uh, see those there, as well as in the current publications. Um, Another project that she undertook in 1990, and uh, if you do the math, she was 80 <laughs> when she began this project um, with uh, Aisha Ben Abed, um, specialist in mosaics at the board, um, Bordeaux Museum. Museum in uh, Tunis and Margaret Alexander, who had been directing the excavations at Tuberbo for many years, and John Foss, um, who was the um, soil specialist, pedologist, who had worked with Wilhelmina at um, Hadrian's Villa and many of her gardens at Pompeii, also came along. And they had very low expectations of a site like this. But in fact, after the aqueduct had been cut, there wasn't a lot of subsequent um, inhabitation of the site, and they almost immediately found um, soil features. Uh, and here you can see from the publication, this decayed 
uh, root cavity. And here you can see the layout of, in black of those root cavities and the smaller ones that uh, Vic, um, Victoria I um, reconstructed in this small model here on the right. So it was heartening to her that some of the methodology developed in the very special conditions at Pompeii had application out in the larger landscape. It was at this time that I began my career. Um, like Willemine Ashemsky, I'd spent about five years on other archeological digs, getting to know the Mediterranean and landscape plants and cultivation of the, the countryside. Um, and my first opportunity to work on um, an ancient garden site was with Ehud Netzer uh, looking at those gardens at Jericho um, that we first saw. And mainly I worked on this, I spent a week and a half at this small garden here um, and brought a lot of the environmental archeology span methods that I had learned with Barry Cunliffe and others at Oxford uh, to the site, taking pollen samples, um, doing uh, uh, phosphate uh, transects and uh, everything I could think of to help understand the garden better. We found the, I found flower pots as had all the other archeologists, found a root cavity within the flower pot. Um, but was not ultimately able to um, identify the specific plants of the garden. Uh, Jeffrey Dimbleby had had a very bad experience with pollen working with Willamina at Aplantis and discouraged me from spending the money on the pollen samples. Well, very recently, uh, uh, Daphna Langa tested the pollen samples that I took back in 1985 and found a profusion of plants and uh, uh, she's published uh, that recently. But uh, so that Jericho was really a remarkable garden in that respect. And I didn't have such good luck with the other gardens of Aaron the Great in terms of preservation. Um, but uh, ultimately I uh, took on, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I began excavating um, Herod's palace at Caesarea Maritima with uh, Barbara Burrell and Ehud Netzer. And this palace was washed by the sea in antiquity, um, but had garden planters all around the central swimming pool uh, with the surf battering the villa outside um, and probably fresh water in the pool. And then the upper palace was heavily um, built over over the years. Uh, and I thought nothing was preserved of the garden except patches of garden soil until Daphna Langa took pollen samples from the plaster on the columns and found plants that would have been in this garden uh, peristyle. So, um, Willemine Yashemsky had set up uh, for Gardens of the Roman Empire uh, this, this series of area editors. And she brought, we brought them all together for a conference at the University of Pennsylvania in 1995. And all the different area editors reported on the gardens that they had found. And it was an extraordinary conference. Um, um, Aisha Malik was a young PhD student reporting on the gardens of North Africa along uh, with her mentor, Madame Blanchard, Alger gardens of Algeria um, and Tunisia and Morocco. Um, uh, here was Ehud Netzer reporting on Judea and parts of Syria. Maureen Carroll reporting on the gardens of Germania. Um, we had several papers on Rome, um, gardens and uh, gardens of, in, around Italy that were not widely known to anyone. And in some, the compendium of, of gardens presented at this conference uh, was in the hundreds and really no one had any idea that there were that many 
extant gardens or gardens that had been identified. Um, and so um, we wanted to, many of these gardens had never been excavated or had been excavated in the past. So when um, uh, Bernard Frischer decided to return to Horace's Villa's excavations, he consulted with Wilhelmina Yashemsky and she uh, recommended a team of us that, who had worked with her before and then Jennifer Ramsey, someone who, one of my students from Caesarea who'd become an archaeobotanist, decided to revisit that, those ex, the gardens at uh, Horace's Villa. And here you can see Thomas Dries Price's model. I, I didn't show that earlier, but uh, uh, this one area had been left standing, had never been excavated. And so if you can see this beveled edge, we dug into it and found the garden layers uh, here. And we used um, a resistivity, ground penetrating radar uh, to, with kind of poor results um, in terms of garden remains. And yet when we dug in, we did find planting pots. Elizabeth Macaulay, who some of you may know is a <laughs> scholar of Roman gardens, found the rim of a flower pot during a solar eclipse. Can you see the kind of sickle shaped shadows? <laughs> so I guess that was auspicious. <laughs> she was a freshman in college at the time and she went on to become a Roman garden specialist herself. Um, and here you can see uh, the kinds of evidence that we get in the ground. Uh, he, these are the, the pits. You can see the impression of a flower pot that was found here of an amphora that had been found in these locations. And essentially we started to find that the, the holes for these plantings were lining up with the central axis of the garden here. It was just a small trench. We found some more soil features on this side flanking the axis on that side. Um, so it was a feasibility study with very good results. Uh, I have fantasized about going back there someday for my <laughs> retirement. Um, uh, so during this time period, this idea of uh, separate from gardens of the Roman Empire, but intellectually integral to it, building on the Dumbarton Oaks, um, that idea that of uh, a subdiscipline of garden archaeology uh, was to, to take these methodologies and try and develop a systematic approach to the excavation of gardens, not just ancient Roman gardens, but gardens of all period. And so we held a, um, a gathering at, at Dumbarton Oaks that I'll mention in a moment. Um, but one of the fellows at Dumbarton Oaks at the time was Leanne Vidal, who was directing excavations um, at Petra in what was considered at the time to be the lower market complex. Um, and she's right here, but she is also, I think, right here in the, in the lecture tonight. <laughs> so if we have any questions. Um, but this team uh, consisted of um, many of the uh, specialists who gathered at Dumbarton Oaks. Um, she was granted a project grant to bring us all over. So Larry Conyers on ground penetrating radar, Amina Aisha Malik, who is a special fellow to coordinate um, a source book for garden archeology. span um, This was our surveyor, uh, Jennifer Ramsey on archaeobotany. Um, uh, John Foss came to oops, do the uh, soil coring. And so we deployed a full range of methods that had been showing really good results on these other garden uh, archaeology projects and brought them together on the Petra project. The ground penetrating radar was fabulous. You can see that it just in a sea of garden soil, everything architectural just popped up in red uh, almost immediately. In fact, it got so that anytime there was a blip, we would put a flag down <laughs> so that we could start excavating <laughs> sooner than later. 
And so this gathering of um, international scholars at Dumbarton Oaks was around this idea of putting together a reliable methodology uh, for any kind of garden archeology. span So all time periods, all geographies. Um, and it was ultimately published, uh, edited by Amina Aisha Malik um, as the source book for garden archeology. span It began as the handbook and it got so heavy that we could not imagine ever actually lugging it out to the site. Um, but the effort was coordinated through these um, uh, roundtables by the three area directors at Dumbarton Oaks and an unusual gathering of the different uh, areas of Byzantine studies, pre-Columbian and landscape studies uh, with Willemine Yashemsky as the senior advisor and Amina Aisha Malik as a, a special fellow to coordinate um, the, the project and uh, Michelle Conan was the director of landscape studies at the time and here and Leanne Vidal there. Uh, so 25 case studies, if you, any kind of garden you're excavating, it's not a very well publicized book, um, but very extremely valuable uh, in the field. So if we take a moment just to look back over um, the progress from when Willamina first started with one very important book and some two important reference books, but not a lot of material out there. When I was a student in the 1980s, there were some important um, exhibition catalogs in Rome. Maureen Carroll's book came out. Inga Nielsen's Hellenistic Palaces came out with some of the first references to um, garden environments rather than architectural plans set on a, a vast white page with no landscape <laughs> implied. Um, uh, the 1990s saw more uh, publications, a, a building interest, uh, who many credit to Yashemsky's uh, efforts at these conferences and subsequent workshops in different countries that promoted these. And I would point out the importance of the Horti Romani conference in 1995 when um, the work of Grimal was revisited um, and through the lens of integrating with archeological evidence and starting to see gardens as really a, the kind of serious subject of a scholarly investigation that Willamina took a huge chance in her <laughs> career on, <laughs> on uh, advancing. Really through my, much of my career, gardens were considered lightweight, um, not serious topics for scholarly study. And if you wanted a kiss of death on a job, then write about gardens for your dissertation. Um, and I think this conference really began along with the other ones I've mentioned to turn around that view and more and more students started uh, taking on the study of ancient Roman gardens to the point where now in the, to the 2000s, there's just been an explosion. Uh, these are mostly books on the, on Roman garden culture. Um, but um, the archeological remains of gardens uh, and investigations have followed at you know, a scale that really underlines the increasing significance of garden studies. So the Vigna Barberini excavations on the Palatine, really a beautiful methodology, a very, very complicated and deeply layered site, um, but one that has been published so that you can really see how these urban gardens were constructed, how they were discovered, but also how they functioned um, as urban gardens in a paved environment. Uh, I always thought the scale was wrong, um, but later when we excavated at Stabia, we found plenty of evidence that the plants were dwarfed uh, in this time period. Um, and the Templum Pacus excavations uh, in Rome of, in the Imperial Fora also giving us a different understanding from the older, this is a, uh, in uh, Ward Perkins, ranks of 
evenly spaced ranks of trees here in the um, reconstruction by Meneghini. The, the, they're portrayed as water features. I visited those excavations. They're pretty complicated, uh, but they did find rows of planting pots with uh, rose pits, great archaeobotany uh, on the site, um, and really giving us a different perspective of um, these major gardens in Rome, both the Horti and the Porticus in uh, central Rome. And garden excavations were happening all around, uh, but but really still probably known best within the areas that they were taking place and often appearing only in archeological journals. So the strategy of having um, these area editors reporting back proved to be very successful. And Willemine Yashemsky received many, many um, uh, uh, emails. She was, here we go, here she is at 90 in front of her uh, computer. Many of my colleagues at 50 really did not like the word processor, but here she is um, managing her email correspondence with the area editors. Um, by this time, um, Aisha Malik and I and Kim Hartswick, as well as a number of other uh, editors had come to help her with this. Um, but you can see that she got up by the end of her life in uh, 2007, we had a thousand, nearly a thousand entries <laughs> reported to us. And this is, you know, this, the computer wasn't great at managing this much data. And so the original plan in which uh, the catalog of sites would inform the volume of essays became unworkable. How do you share this with all the other essayists to, to write? So ultimately in the end, volume one became the volume of essays um, and was printed uh, to be printed with 13 authors, 18 different chapters, really summarizing this great um, body of work that had been uh, building up as I've described. And then volume two just became too successful. It, there were too many entries for a print volume. Cambridge just wasn't going to do it. They recommended a DVD or a CD at the back of the book and Willamina liked that idea. Um, and so uh, we started, um, Klopper Alman offered to digitize images um, and that was the, the plan to go digital. Uh, she died on Chris, morning of Christmas Eve in 2007 with the manuscript of volume one on her lap. And uh, I became the executive editor of the, the manuscript. Um, and it was a, a conundrum of this. Then once we fleshed out those, <laughs> all those entries, there was a, we would need a second CD at the back of the book and they didn't want us to, uh, <laughs> that wasn't financially feasible. So we started surfing the wave of the digital uh, publications. Um, and ultimately, uh, I'll describe this in a minute, settled on um, a, a digital website. But this, you know, the, the compendium that I'll describe to you is largely with adi some additions, what uh, Willemine Yashemsky uh, left at the time of her her death, she had received the AIA gold medal in 1996 for her efforts, the, the lectureship in, her, in honor of her work and Stanley Yashemsky's in putting this uh, massive uh, corpus of information together, coordinating the scholars and um, bringing um, an encyclopedic uh, range of um, entries together. 83 authors. <laughs> and so the print book came out in 2018, uh, posthumously, um, with uh, Kim Hartswick, Aishamina, Alec Malikin, I uh, doing the final editing with <laughs> great help from many other people. Um, and we particularly thank Beatrice Rail, the original 
who has stayed with us through all these decades of work on the project and her editorial team, Wilhelmina Yashemsky would have been so pleased uh, that it, the book won a number of publication awards, but in particular that it won the Elizabeth Blair McDougall Award um, for the best work in landscape history from the Society of Architectural Historians after those initial conferences with her at Dumbarton Oaks in 1979 and 1984. So the great compendium of sites is, um, we tried a number of different options. I won't go into the details, but I will thank um, Roger Bagnall at New York University at the Institute for the Study of um, the Ancient World at Esau. Um, who put me in touch with David Ratzan and Christian Casey to solve the problem of how to manage this huge body of data. And um, they put together um, uh, a solution uh, in the form of a blog-based uh, kind of website um, that would be uh, free um, and open access, um, uh, this was something Cambridge University Press had also suggested and was supportive of. It was it, it's linked to volume one via the uh, CUP website. So if you go to buy the book, you'll see the, the link. And the two projects do interact, um, not digitally yet, but they're cross-referenced within the text. Um, but the site will be independent of uh, Cambridge and it'll be updatable. So it's a project that's going to go into the future with a new group of scholars um, and can be kept up to date. Its data can be mined, new projects can be built from it um, and it's interactive. It was created with relatively inexpensive software. This was an old legacy project, very difficult to raise money for it. Um, so we were able to come up with a solution that would allow um, future scholars to run the site with inexpensive software, fairly easy to learn, archivally stable, and the programs were, uh, we built the sites within Atom um, using Markdown, um, and then developed the website with Hugo, a blog software, um, and then pushed it up onto the internet through Git GitHub. <laughs> and I have limited ability to answer questions about that, but I'm learning it quite well myself. And then we also paired it by with uh, Keith Jenkins at Cornell helped us create a map in ArcGIS. And here for the first time, uh, you can see the layout of the site. Um, this is a mock-up Ironically, you know, the way these things work, the site is down right now for construction for the final push <laughs> for the launch on April 15th. But it looks something like this. So uh, we'll have different tabs. Uh, always on the left, you'll see the provinces under Trajan, the empire at its greatest extent. And you can click on these. Um, this is the launch site. Learn a bit about the project and find out that it's in a beta stage. So for those who are gamers and understand this world, we're not putting up perfection, which is really hard for us geezers, um, but we're putting it up, we're getting this legacy data up, we're getting it out to the public uh, and to students and scholars to start using, but also in this beta world, to give us feedback, updates, and work to make this a really great reference um, site. And here you can see all the uh, sites of Roman gardens uh, around the empire, perhaps more than you might have thought uh, might exist, um, a really rich record. And I'd just like to close by taking you through this uh, site uh, here. This is the organization, <laughs> which I put up partly just to stress what a large project this has become from that description I gave you of Willamina's method for the gardens of Pompeii. Uh, this project has really followed the collaborative process through to almost uh, film credit like 
<laughs> um, structure with many, many students involved in my seminars, helping out with all the scanning and digitizing work. We've moved from editorial editors to editorial teams where we have the original area editors, new scholars and those trained in um, the e-humanities and the software. Sometimes they're the same people like uh, Liam Vidal is a original area editor for Arabia Petraea and she can do the <laughs> digital work, but uh, other areas we've got uh, uh, teams with these different backgrounds and we're seeking more. So if anyone out there would like to join us, we're, we welcome you. So you can navigate the site by, uh, let's go to Italia. You could either click on the province here or you could um, click on a particular site. So if we go to Pompeii um, and you were to root out which dot is Pompeii on our interactive map, uh, you could get there or by clicking on Italia. If you clicked here, this would lead you to Pompeii. And the big thing we're doing right now is setting it up by city. Uh, so you'd go from province to city and then to the name of the house uh, within Pompeii. Alternatively, <clears throat> if you zoomed in to the map and clicked on one of these buttons, you'll get a box which has the link directly not in this case to the site because there's 600 <laughs> nearly well probably 500 and some gardens in Pompeii um, and so it will take you to a map that we're developing with Eric Poehler and the Pompeii bibliography and mapping project to take you uh, to the point here and um, and then in turn to the entry I didn't plan this, Leanne, but uh, if you were to want to discover Petra, let's uh, have a look at that. Um, you would go to Arabia Petraea, or you could go there via the map, um, a dot here. And uh, the map would take you to the link. And since it's uh, there are not many gardens in that province yet, uh, clicking in the province would take you to the Petra Garden and Pool Project. Now I'm going to take you to the site. It's uh, it is functioning, but it's not. There are a lot of, of student errors that are showing up, so it's I'm not. Let's see. Can you see that now? I might have to stop. Can someone, Raina? Can you say yes or no? Nod or. No, we can't see it yet. Okay, so I'll just uh, quickly take you there. Oops. So this is this will all look differently, and a lot of these cities that appeared from Gaul out of nowhere into the province list will change. But let's have a look at a sample entry. It's the Petra Garden and Pool Com. Plex, if you look, you can uh, learn more about the wow. province. We'll click over to Pleiades. Uh, as you read about the history of the province, you can, there are links to Wikipedia and other reference sites. Um, same with Petra. We're, um, Pleiades is an ESAW project, so we're coordinating with them to actually write a lot of the entries for Pleiades um, for different areas here. So you can use the Pleiades mapping project and get a definitive location. Um, one of the features my students like a lot are, is the keyword definition. These take you to the Getty um, thesaurus online. And so if you're a Chinese student who is trying to figure out what an exedra is, it's also provided in Chinese and different languages. So it's a wonderful tool uh, for working internationally to be sure you're on the same page with, with terminology. 
And we're also working on the keywords so that you can see other sites around the empire. This isn't a database, so we're really pushing the limits of a blog site to do this, but we're working on so that if you wanted to see what other sites had flower pots, uh, you could click on this. Now we're not hooked up yet to the Google search engine on this, so it's, it's not, you'll have to wait for the 15th to test the, the function on that. So here's the description of the gardens. Um, and these are then, you also have illustrations. Leanne's provided the most recent plan of the garden complex. The GPR results, the setting, the flower pots that were found there, a list of the archaeobotanical remains. Um, and some comparative wall paintings from a little Petra nearby showing some of the, the plant culture. The bibliography is linked to WorldCat. Um, and here's the Pleiades ID again, and we'll be linking the contributor's name uh, back to information about the author. So those are some of the features of an individual entry. And I'm just gonna stop share and go back to the PowerPoint for a second. Oops, <laughs> maybe not. So that's our website and um, we hope that you'll enjoy um, exploring this next week. Uh, that'll be our beta launch. We, you can get at this site now. I don't encourage it. You'll find something of a, a mess. Uh, we're having a blackout period until from tomorrow through the 12th for the final construction of the site. And uh, then you should start to be able to find it uh, online. I'll try and arrange for the link to be shared in some way uh, with your society, but it should Google really easily when you search for gardens of the Roman empire, you should get right to this site and um, explore some of the new findings. The, um, the Gardens of the Roman Empire project is not completely up to date. Um, Pompeii will just be Willemine Yashemsky's catalog. I think that's a wonderful contribution. Those, her books are difficult to, to get and uh, much of that information will be available on this website. Um, but uh, we, Look forward to having interested students uh, and anyone critique the site, help us find the mistakes, the things that aren't working, give us feedback in this beta period. And we look forward to your ideas and your um, perspectives. <laughs> so I'll just close by thanking my own students uh, who not only spent some part of every seminar in my Roman gardens class, working on digitizing and scanning, but also tried uh, experiencing the Roman garden from Ithaca, New York with green screen technology, humiliating strolls through public spaces on campus in full costumes and uh, uh, helping to us to advance our understanding of, of the ancient garden. So thank you all very much and uh, Happy to take any, any questions. There's a question in the chat, Kath, uh, if you'd like to look at that one. Okay, so are the planting plots of the same size or did they vary? Um, uh, so they did vary but not by as much as you would think. So the smallest, there are very small ones from Petra, 
Um, most pots are roughly uh, 18 to 24 centimeters or so, different shapes, but generally in that range, they always have a hole in the bottom, typically three in the sides, but at different positions of the, the wall of the, the pot. And they were used to propagate the plant and transport it to its new location. That part is clear from the ancient sources, but then the size of the pot may also have to do with miniaturizing or reducing the size of the plant. And uh, that's another lecture, but the paint or the evidence from wall paintings together with the evidence in the ground is suggesting uh, we're getting a lot of evidence from the pollen and really quite definitive evidence that they're getting a lot of tree species into a very small space. And the advantage of dwarfing your trees is you can get lots of different fruits and flowering effects, but mostly um, fruits and nuts in a very small space. So these pots do seem to be similar. If you wanted to move to a larger size, you would use uh, reuse an amphora, cut it in half and, and use that. I was actually surprised to see that there was any dwarfing going on. I always thought that the Romans were really interested in having shade and yeah. the dwarf plants clearly wouldn't provide those. I know it, it, it's because uh, clearly when you look at the Roman villa paintings, there are shade trees rising up above the buildings and, and it does seem like they worked out how to have both. <laughs> like, uh, the Villa Ariana, which I didn't show because it's one of the more recent paintings, we did have larger uh, trees to one side and then these long walkways with much smaller plants um, planted along. Um, so I think they worked out a balance that, that we still, we just haven't dug enough gardens to make uh, but I think it's pretty new to think that they were dwarfing. But if you put the villa, the garden room of, of Livia Prima Porta to scale, those trees are dwarfed. Someone asked if, if the website I'm talking about is the one that's mentioned on the Cambridge site. So they're gonna, uh, that was the old website that we were building around a map. Um, and it, it was asleep. <laughs> um, and we'll be changing that out uh, next week with the new website address. So yes, it's go to the same place. It'll be a different URL, but that, it, that will be the website. Uh, is the Getty Villa a good reproduction of a Roman garden? Um, I think it's a little, in my view, it's a little topiaried in later styles than I, but I, I think the degree of care and maintenance, the, um, some of the experiments in recreating imperial Roman gardens or the gardens of the elite just make you realize how much money it takes to maintain those gardens. <laughs> They're very hard to give enough water and enough horticultural care to keep them going. I don't know if any of you have been to a plantus recently, but it's very hard to and expensive to maintain a garden um, the way we think they might have been planted in the more elite gardens in the Vesuvian region. And, and so I, in a way, I think the Getty Villa is a good reproduction in the sense that it's meticulously cared for and with its full and beautiful displays of art in ways that are, are harder to do in more public um, settings like Pompeii. Have we created page overlays to show the levels from the current state to what is thought to be the completed oh, book or website. Well, so the, <laughs> I always love those uh, guidebooks you could get that had the little overlay where you could put it over the ruins of Pompeii. Um, we haven't, I'm trying to think, I mean, 
we're working, one of the things that is a, still a problem with ancient gardens is that in, in architecture or other fields are very clear conventions for representing what was found, what's a reasonable extension from what was found and what's a pure recreation. And right now gardens are a free for all. You, you can't look at a, a garden restoration and have any idea whether it's an accurate recreation or not. So we're still at the stage of developing a series of steps that would allow you to understand when you look at a garden restoration on paper, uh, whether it's um, uh, based on evidence or not. So my answer is no, <laughs> it just raises, there are efforts now happening to try and show a series of images from archeological remains through to reconstruction, um, but not necessarily one laid over the other <laughs> at this point. Let's see, you've talked about the pollen records. Is there something that was grown in the gardens that was unusual? I think one of the things that was a little surprising to me in some of the results that we've been getting, uh, for example, at, um, in the upper peristyle at Caesarea, we found hazelnut. And it didn't blow in from anywhere else. It's a plant that was brought into the Eastern Mediterranean have, as a popular plant from Rome. And now we are finding hazelnut in elite garden settings. <laughs> and that seems really peculiar to me in this day and age. Uh, I just, you just have to, have to change your mindset a little bit. But that these are, the gardens are not displays of flowers but displays of shrubs, but really displays of trees in many instances is, is somewhat surprising. Many of the gardens that you'll see reconstructed are these quadripartite gardens, four square uh, gardens with flowers or hedges. That doesn't seem to be what was going on. At least it seemed to be these um, displays. So we're Weridia, we're plant collections, and Weridiaria, we're gatherings of plant displays. And so, the, and they were meant to be appreciated as you strolled rather than sitting <laughs> or looking at patterns. Um, so, how are you able to differentiate the later gardens from the earlier gardens or indigenous flora that may have existed there? So, with the Mediterranean, we have an excellent archaeobotanical record of those earlier periods. So, uh, archaeobotany in the classical period is a, rather a newcomer. Um, so, the archaeobotanists who are now they're you know a good group working on them have this much larger record of landscape change and archaeobotany in the past to compare it to. Um, and, and indigenous flora is not such a simple question uh, because by the time you get to the Roman period, plant trade has been going on a long time. So uh, it's what, what makes something indigenous, how, how many centuries, like, are tomatoes really Italian? You know, so, because they came from the new world half a millennia ago. So I guess those are some of the questions you might uh, think about with that. But later gardens from earlier gardens is a good question. Where The garden we're digging now um, and Horace's Villa, the earlier gardens were separated by layers of leveling fill to raise the garden. So the stratigraphy is really clear. You get garden soil for the later garden, then you get this leveling fill that isn't good for any kind of cultivation. It's either rubble or clay. And then under that is the next layer of cultivated soil. Um, how is Willemina's recording of her archeological work different from others for her time? I think, um, well, if I compare, I, I dug at Sardis 
worked at Sardis for five years, and there they kept much fuller day books. So it was a narrative tradition in the 60s. Um, but on a different format. <laughs> uh, I was quite startled when I finally got to see your day books that they were just these little flip memo pads or sideways, but not never big notebooks. Um, and so in that sense, and but then I realized how compact they were. They were in a way cryptic, but she packed a lot of information uh, into those. I think other teams just had bigger staff, you know, uh, photographers, with dark rooms and teams of surveyors, teams of draftsmen. So this keeping it small, she didn't bring her own student. Her students visited her on digs, but generally she didn't have a team of students working with her. It was, she worked with Stanley and specialists coming in and out, but mainly with her, with the work team. And I think that was somewhat unusual. Um, yeah, so in Michelle Palmer's map of the urban gardens, we didn't differentiate types. There are many types of gardens. And um, so the spaces you see are not uh, just elite gardens. They're the full range shop gardens, um, Capona restaurant gardens, uh, and then these quite large uh, vineyards and gardens with market gardens within the city walls. Um, so uh, that's a full range. It's just showing you uh, the cultivated green space that's been identified as a garden. Oh, beehives. I, that's a really interesting question. I think there is evidence, and I think. Uh, Maybe someone else in the audience knows, so, but I do believe there are people working on uh, on that subject. There, I know of some pots in Judea that there's some debate whether they were for bees or for flower pots, <laughs> but not Roman period. Well, I think that's all the questions in the chat. Um, any others? Well, well, Catherine, thank you very, very much for your for your time this evening. I know it's late for you off on the East Coast, uh, and thanks everyone for your attention and for the for the great questions at the end. Uh, it's a so thank you. Yeah, I see some claps coming your way. <laughs> the, the, uh, virtual <laughs> clapping. So I'm happy uh, to hang out a while if there's anyone. <laughs> okay. But with that, I think we will we'll call it an evening. Uh, thanks again for for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you all next fall uh, with our our hopefully in person uh, lecture series. Until then. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Wish I could be going out to dinner with you all and meeting you in person <laughs> or whatever you normally do after your talks. So true. <laughs> yes, thank you very much.